All right. Well, thank you all for coming, and uh, thanks particularly to Mike, who sets all of these up um, and makes sure that they run and gets us stuff in the back. Um, I know this is sort of a mixed audience, so I've got a handful of things that I want to do, and my concern is it might get a little long, um, so I'm going to try to keep moving through things. But if you have any questions, please, I'll be more than happy to go back over those, um, at the end and answer any specific questions that you have. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me, but my talk today really has three main goals. The first one is I simply want to introduce some of you to my field work um, and show some pictures of where I was. I've got three chapters in my dissertation which I'm coming close to being finished on, so I'll give you a sense of what those chapters look like. Um, then, because a lot of you are here because you're interested in Afghanistan, I want to consider the notion of the failed state. It's a word that's been coming up in the media a lot recently. Obama's just pre promised to send 17,000 troops to Afghanistan. And a lot of the justification of this is the fear that Afghanistan is or will be a failed state. So I want to ask what that means. And finally, I want to suggest that perhaps, while failed state isn't a very useful term for anthropology, I want to look at the state in Afghanistan, Afghanistan through an alternative paradigm, through the paradigm um, of a lot of literature and anthropology that comes from studies of totalitarian states, actually. And this doesn't, this isn't necessarily something uh, that springs to mind, but I believe there's some useful ideas here. Um, but this is a part of my dissertation that really I'm working on right now. So I very much welcome your comments um, and criticisms of it. So uh, let's get started then. Um, this is the town of Istalif. It's about 30 miles north of Kabul. I was here for about 18 months <coughs> studying the town. As you can see, it's in the foothills of the Hindu Kush. You can see the snow up there. Um, and as a result, there's a lot of water flowing through town. This is the river that runs through the middle of town. This is the fall, so the river's um, not very full in the spring. It really sort of rages. Um, and the result is there's a very complex series of irrigation channels around town. Um, that bring water to different orchards and also create some very beautiful little pools. And if you've been to Bukhara, it's very reminiscent of Bukhara in a lot of ways. Um, and if you're looking for a dissertation topic on my town, if I had to do another dissertation, I would do it on the politics of water sharing. Mm -hmm. um, but that's still out there for anyone who's interested. Um, as a result, the town is well known for, particularly for its fruits. There's a lot of pomegranates, a lot of mulberries, uh, grapes, uh, and there's just terrific fruits in the bazaar. Uh, but as you can see, during the winter, it gets quite snowy, and essentially the town goes into hibernation for about three months each winter. The real reason I was there, though, is because Istalif, for being a very small town, has a quite sizable bazaar. Um, and a lot of merchants come up from Kabul to sell their goods, and there's a lot of villages in the mountains around Istalif, so the villagers will come in to buy things around there. And I'm sorry, this picture is really not that great, but that's actually the animal bazaar that springs up alongside the river on Fridays, and villagers bring down sheep and goats to sell them. Uh, this is the main street, and uh, you can see this is a, a local butcher. A lot of Kabbalists say the best meat around Kabul comes from Istalif because it's fresh from the mountains. Uh, and as a result of the sizable bazaar, there's actually a large number of artisans, and we'll get to them in a second because they're important to my story. Istalif has a long history. It was visited by Emperor Babur in the 15th century. This is actually a lithograph from the 1830s, and if I had paid $350, the Royal Geographic Society would have taken their initials off of it, but I haven't gotten around to doing that yet. Um, but because it's a beautiful spot, it's been visited by a lot of people, but it's also a very strategic spot, and this has led to several tragic chapters in Istalif's history. So this lithograph, which was done in the 1830s, was done by some of the uh, British explorers that uh, preceded the British occupation of Kabul uh, that ended tragically in the massacre of the British troops in 1842. In retribution, the <coughs> British forces from India returned and they blew up the bazaar in Kabul and they burned Istalif, my town, to the ground because that served as sort of a rallying point for rebels on the outskirts. Of Kabul. This repeated itself in 1920 twice by Pashtun tribesmen from the south. And then here, more important in our story, in the winter of 1997-1998, it was leveled by the Taliban. Um, all the main stores in the center of town were blown up. 
Um, and the roofs would burn off the rest of the buildings. The town was left completely abandoned for about three years. This picture was taken by a reporter friend of mine in uh, 2002 when it just returned, when people were just beginning to return to um, Estelit. But these pictures here are pictures I took in the first year or 18 months or so. Um, so you can see the damage is still very visible. Most people have returned, but certainly not all. Um, another thing you'll notice is in um, Afghanistan, of course, all of the architecture tends to be mud-based. So even worse than the destruction by the Taliban, what you get is simply by being abandoned for three years because it's mud and no maintenance is being done, the walls slowly crumble. So it's hard to tell whether this was actually uh, this wall was actually damaged by uh, fighting or whether it's simply time wore away because there's no maintenance while people were not in the town. Um, but as I said, we'd return to the artisans because this is what sort of triggered a lot of my study. And crafts in Istalif, there are various number of them. We've got a weaver there. They make up a large clan. Uh, we've got a basket weaver here, and this is the leather workers. And crafts in Istalif are patrilineally learned. Um, so you can only learn it from your father or one of his brothers, um, maybe from one of your brothers. Um, and the group that I was most interested in were the potters. And this is the group that I spend most of my time with. There's a large number of clay deposits up in the mountains. You bring the clay down, um, you clean the clay. And especially the sort of the optimum number in a workshop is about three or four <laughs> brothers, where uh, two brothers will prepare the clay, another two brothers are on the wheel spinning right there. And the real skill of the Iskalafi potters comes from their ability to make these pots. A workshop can crank out almost two of these pots a minute. Um, however, the clay is not very good quality, the um, glaze is not very high quality, and their firing techniques aren't terrific. So I've got, actually got a pot you can take a look at later. Um, but you'll see the quality of them is not terrific. But they do have a monopoly on making glazed pots in Afghanistan. So I did a survey of the bazaars in Kabul, and every single glazed pot in Afghanistan is made by this group of 300 families, essentially. Um, you have some unglazed earthenware pots that are made by other people, but this glaze technique, they're the only group that really has it. Um, but what I was interested in, and this is sort of the first two chapters of my dissertation, are the politics of the group. And they call themselves a column, and a column is a patrilineal descent group. Sometimes it's translated as tribe, sometimes it's translated in the literature as clan, and a lot of my first chapter of my dissertation argues over what the best meaning of this term actually is. But the head of the column is the Malik. There's the Malik right here, Abdul Salam. Um, he leads the group. He rules mostly by consensus, but he is called the bridge to the government. So he acts as sort of the representative. This man right here is Malik Salam's son. And the position of Malik is something that's patrilineally inherited, but there's some flexibility in this. So if the son is not considered worthy by the community, they'll select somebody else. Um, and so Abdul Manan is one of my best informants. Um, and one of my good friends there, but his position for me was fascinating because he was slated to be the next Malik, um, but he always had to watch how he acted in public. Uh, so he would sort of joke around with his friends, but then get very serious when he felt they were going too far. Now, politics within the column, in a lot of ways, fits traditional tribal models in Afghanistan. Right? Uh, what you get is oftentimes the Malik solidifies his uh, power by hosting large feasts. So here's Abdul Jabbar making a, a large vat of rice for a gathering over here. Um, similarly, the Malik uses marriage alliances to um, solidify his power. But in many ways, ideas of tradition are inadequate because the Malik does a lot of things which are also very modern. He negotiates with international military troops. He has military people come visit him. He has figured out how to channel NGO funds into the town. Um, and he manipulates these relationships with groups in um, Kabul in particular. But these are the first two chapters of my dissertation. The third one sort of talks about the political scene in general in Istalif. And it turns out that there's actually a number of groups of political actors beyond the columns, beyond these patrilineal descent groups. So you have religious leaders who are closely allied with the columns for the most part. 
This man right here is the chief moolah in town, but there's probably around another 250, 300 moolahs in the town. This is the central bazaar. There's a lot of uh, shrines around town as well. Um, this is actually quite an interesting shrine. The legend has it is that a British woman who uh, was from London who converted to Islam 100 years ago, and somehow she ended up in Istal. Um, I couldn't find any real historical basis for that story, but it's fascinating that they tell it. Um, in addition to religious leaders, you have former warlords. This man right here is Sufi Razak. He's the main warlord in town. Um, the Ministry of the Interior, which was in charge of de-arming all these former warlords, is Tajik. And all of uh, the people I lived with were Tajik, too. So they tended to cooperate with the Ministry of the Interior more than other groups did. So for the most part, Sufi Razak has handed in his guns. Um, of course, for the most part. Um, he keeps some, as he says, for personal protection. Um, and this still makes him a bit of a player, but very much a man who stays on the sideline. Also importantly, Sufi Razak and a few of the others have traded in some of this military um, for economic capital. So Sufi Razak, as part of the deal in which he handed over a lot of his heavy weapons, um, got the largest Toyota dealership in Kabul. So he now, or rather his son, runs the Toyota dealership in Kabul. Um, in addition to this, and we don't have enough time to really get into this, but there's a new merchant class, which is quite fascinating. Um, for the most part, these are men who, as refugees, went to Peshawar, or they went to the UAE. They earned a large amount of income. They've come back and do are doing a lot of trading. The really interesting thing is a large number of these are weavers by trade, because a bunch of the weavers went to Peshawar and used their knowledge of weaving to enter the carpet industry, which was quite lucrative. Um, however, there's, and again, can't quite have enough time to get into it, there's something of a caste system in town. So weavers are considered a lower status socially than other groups. So it creates this interesting paradox right now that they're confronted with, where these former weavers have quite a bit of money, but don't actually have, aren't very respected as a group in town. Next, we have the international community, which in Istalip takes two forms. You have the international military. Um, over here, the French patrol an area just north of Kabul. So the French were in charge of uh, providing security for the town for the most part, which basically meant that they rolled through town in these uh, vehicles. There's usually a convoy of about six of them three or four times a week. Uh, we were also visited by French, uh, sorry, German, Canadian, and American uh, troops on a fairly regular basis. Uh, also, in addition to troops, you have NGOs. Um, and I've just included this picture right here. And take a look at how these men are dressed. They work for an NGO that works in Istalif. Uh, and one of the interesting things about this idea of the international community, I don't necessarily mean internationals, right? Because most of the interfacing that goes on between an Istalifi and an international NGO is usually with these employees who are Afghan themselves. Um, the interesting thing about who NGOs hire are NGOs often hire young men who have been educated abroad and fled as refugees. So both of these men lived in Pakistan, were educated in Pakistan. You'll notice they don't have beards, they don't dress um, in the traditional robes. Um, and so there's, there's a slight disconnect uh, that's meaningful there. Um, and finally, I just threw this up as sort of for fun. These uh, are scattered all over Afghanistan. It's hard to go more than a mile or two without passing one. But uh, if you can't read it, it says, this project has been provided to the people of Afghanistan by the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan and the people of the United States of America. We're going to come back to that in a second. But note, the pe it's provided to the people of Afghanistan by the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan. So it creates a divide between the people and the republic. Um, two other things just to note in here. Um, right here is the translation of the phrase in Dari. Right here is the translation of the phrase in Pashto. And this is in Istalif, which is a town where nobody speaks Pashto. And in fact, um, they don't really appreciate Pashto figures, uh, speakers. So it's interesting that uh, the US is now running around tossing up Pashto slogans in a Dari-speaking town. Um, and the final thing to note, and you're not going to be able to see this, but in terms of the vocabulary of um, international assistance, the top line in Dari, this starts here, this project, 
the top line in Dari says in proja. So it's project simply transliterated. Um, they use the English phrase still. It um, can't be translated. And so finally, uh, to get to the heart of our talk, we are talking about the state. And the state in Istalif is represented in two real ways, the police and the district governor. Um, I'll refer to him sometimes as the sub-governor because he's called both. Um, and unfortunately, I'm now running out of pictures because we're now talking about the state. Of course, state officials don't like to wear a camera in front of them as potters do. So unfortunately, I don't have a lot, too many more pictures. Um, but I think some of these pictures are interesting. Um, this man right here is the chief of police, one of the two chiefs of police that was here, a figure in one of the stories I'm about to tell. Um, and when you ask, what do the police do in town? Well, uh, for the most part, most Istalifis would say, well, you know, they simply bother us. And that's one of the reasons why I put this photograph up here. What is this? This is a dogfight um, in between Kabul and Istalif. And what happens is the dogfights are actually quite brief, but you spend the entire morning there sizing up the different dogs and making your bets. Um, and so these are two typical policemen. Are they providing security there? Probably not. But the police simply show up at events like this and act as if uh, they're doing something important. But really, they're just sort of hanging around. In um, what does the state do in Istalif? Well, it's easier to answer the question of what the state doesn't do. The state doesn't collect taxes. Um, in fact, not only does it not collect taxes, but I showed you a picture of the bazaar before. The bazaar is made up of 25 or 250 um, stationary set fixed shops and about 30 carts that are, can be moved around. Um, and those carts are either on the main strip on that main road or they're placed in the public park. And if you park your cart in the park, you have to pay rent to the local warlord. Um, so the local warlord actually collects rent from public lands. Um, in addition to this, thinking about providing services. Um, does the state provide services? Uh, well, there's a large program, the largest amount of funds that get um, generated and given to local um, groups is through what's called the National Solidarity Project, the NSP. Um, and the NSP is a terrific idea where on the local level you elect these small councils called um, CDCs and these CDCs then decide what they're going to do with the money. However, the national government has decided that the local government can't actually administer this. All this money comes from the World Bank. So in each district, a certain NGO has been selected to administer the distribution of government funds. So in Istalif, it was a French NGO called ACTED. Um, and what happens is even while this is given government funds, the very important act of actually handing out the money is done by an NGO employee. It's not being done by a government official. In addition to this, you have um, clinic, a clinic, in, which is actually quite a good one by Afghan standards, in, um, right next to the sub-governor's office. This clinic, of course, is... Sorry, I keep jumping. Um, Stops. I don't know if I hit my mic. Play. Um, oh, doesn't like that one. <laughs> um, this clinic is run by a Canadian NGO, um, and while technically it's supposed to answer to the sub-governor, really it answers to the NGO offices in, um, in Kabul, in particular. And similarly, the schools. The schools were all rebuilt by German, a German NGO and a French NGO. So this gets us to the idea of a failed state. And unfortunately, that map, which I can't seem to show you, um, is our map of failed states worldwide. But usually when we're talking about failed states, what are we talking about? Well, they, the failed state index is funded each year by the Fund for Peace. It's published by Foreign Policy, the journal. Um, and they use 12 indicators that you can see up here um, to determine whether a state is failed or not. Um, and Afghanistan 
has been climbing the charts. In 2005, it was the 11th most failed state in the world, according to the failed state index. In 2006, when I started my study, it was the 10th most failed. 2007, it was the 8th. And last year, it was the 7th. Um, and I put asterisks next to the ones that Afghanistan scores the highest on, according to their measures. And what are their measures? Well, it's these 12 right here, and let's take a look at them in Istalif. Well, demographic pressures, yes. Refugees and displaced people, every single person in town was a refugee, so yes. Group grievance, the town, uh, this is, uh, are their internal political grievances? Again, yes, it was burned down by a group of southern Pashtuns. Human flight, yes. Uneven development, yes, you've got this very rich merchant class. Economic decline, um, yes. Delegitimization of the state, yes, and we'll get to this a little bit more. Public services, again, you have some in, Af in Istalif, but not very many. Human rights, often violated by the police, and that's not to begin talking about human rights and women. Uh, security apparatus uh, is unstable, and there's lots of militias wandering around. A factionalized elite, yes, and an external intervention in the shape of French troops that come through every other day. So. According to this list, it seems as if Afghanistan is a failed state. But that doesn't feel right to me when I'm in Istalif. In Istalif, the state is considered a serious actor still. There's respect for the state. Um, the state does not seem to be on the verge of collapse in Istalif. So let's think about this definition that we're looking at here. And this, of course, is very much a term that's used by political scientists more than anthropologists. Um, and it's got something of a laundry list approach, of course, a series of variables that we're looking at. But I want us to think for a second, and it seems to me that this definition is primarily a Weberian conception of the state, right? It sees the state as a bureaucracy, which it organizes economics and politics and has a monopoly on violence within its territory. Now, the interesting thing about Weber's notion of the state is, well, Weber was very good at integrating ideas of culture into uh, religion and into economics. He really didn't integrate culture into his notion of the rationalized state. And in fact, his idea of the state is very much void of culture. Um, it's completely rationalized. Um, and as a result, I feel anthropologists have, for the most part, steered clear of the term. The one major exception to this is Noam Chomsky, who wrote a book called Failed States. Um, his definition is actually similar to this. There's a little more flexibility in it. He says that a failed state provi uh, fails to provide security, fails to guarantee rights at home, and fails to maintain a functioning democratic institution. Um, and now this definition adds a little bit of flexibility to these 12 variables, I think. Um, but it still doesn't develop the phrase very much and is unsatisfactory. Um, now, to give Chomsky some credit, um, really the point of his book is he rather artfully uses the term to uh, point to some of the ironies of the United States and other Western European countries using the term when they themselves fail to live up to its standards. But let's think about the state a little bit more. Since Weber, anthropology has focused much more on how the state penetrates into daily life. So famously, you have Foucault referring to the etatization of the state. The reverse process of this, Nicholas Rose argues, is the destatization of the government. For me, however, I think in Istalif, I don't see much evidence of this. There's no real attempt to regulate commerce. There's no attempt to regulate religion. Order and discipline is carried out by traditional leaders, and it's done in a very personal way. Instead, what I think is most remarkable about the state in Istalif is there seems to me to be an urgency to preserve and emphasize the divide between the state and society. And here I want to think about Geertz for a little bit, because his idea of state and theater as theater in Bali, I think, will help us. Geertz, of course, looks primarily at how elaborate state ritual reflects an ideal order while recreating that order in political life. This creates a model of and a model for state power. 
geared to, encourages us to use symbols to study how the state is manifested. So let's do this just for a moment. Um, and I'm, what I'm arguing here is that in Istalif, the state symbols do not order society and do not produce state power as much as their real point is to further demarcate this divide between the state and society. And just uh, to be clear, I'm not actually arguing that there is a divide between state and society here. I'm arguing that um, in Istalif, people create this divide. They want there to be a divide. Um, so look, let's look at some of these symbols. And this isn't a terrific map. Um, you're going to have to bear with me a little bit. But this is Istalif. Istalif is built on two hills. There's a hill here and a hill here. Um, the south face of the hills are irrigated because they get the most sun. So you can see it's rather well settled here, but very barren right there. Very settled here, but very barren up there. The green is the river that separates the two main hills. The yellow is the bazaar. And these red dots are the main religious points in town. And so Istalif is really built on these two hills. The top of this hill is the central shrine in town, which is the main religious area. And most of the town's population and uh, most of the really nice houses and gardens are in this stretch right below the shrine and a few more down along the river. So you get this hill right here, which has the shrine and the population on it. This right here is the sub-governor's office and the clinic is right over there. So you get these two hills, um, the state on one hill, religion and all the rest of uh, the population on the other hill, and they just sort of sit there looking at each other. It's, um, you can feel the divide. Um, but it goes beyond simply a spatial divide, um, and I want to talk a little bit about hats for a second. Um, and this is an article which I'm probably not going to be published for quite some time, but I've been thinking a lot about hats. Um, and hats are very important for Afghan men. Almost every Afghan man wears a hat. And if you're not wearing a hat, it's almost as important as wearing a hat. Um, but again, not a great picture. You can see the police chief's hat right here. Um, it's uh, your typical policeman's hat. It's a little bit military. Um, and so that's an official police hat. Um, they always are wear their hats. Um, this is what you call a puck hole right there. Um, and in Istalif, the Pakols uh, were made famous, of course, by Ahmed Shah Massoud, the great resistance fighter. Um, so if you're a young thug and you want to be known, you know, you're cool, you're a little dangerous. In fact, this man's name is Daoud al which means dangerous Daoud. Um, <laughs> but you wear the Pakol um, to show your um, affinity for these groups. Of course, if uh, those of you who know Tom Barfield, this is the hat that the next hat is, of course, the skull cap. This hat much more symbolizes an affinity for uh, religious figures in town. Um, this is Jaweed, um, who's a particularly pious young man. Um, and so there's a strong contrast right here between these two hats. Of course, later in life, you're allowed to wear the turban, but you can't wear that turban until you become a riche safed or a white beard. Um, and then these pictures are actually from uh, Kabul, because this is the Karakol hat, which uh, Karzai wears. Um, and the Karakol hat is probably was made most famous by the ruling elite in the 1960s and 70s. So it uh, harkens back to sort of the bureaucracy of that era. Um, and finally, these are a group of woodworkers in Kabul. Um, and I know very few people who wear this hat, but this is what they call a Russian hat. Um, and the uh, interesting thing about this is this type of hat is actually made in Istanbul. Um, Um, this type of hat is made in Istalif, um, and yet no Istalif would ever wear it because it's too Russian. So m my suspicion is actually that this man might be a former communist. I'm not actually sure, but I would um, be interested um, if I see him again alive. Um, so you have this way of uh, dressing that associates you um, with the state if you are a member of the state. And finally, uh, I want to add one last picture. This is uh, not taken by me. This is actually from the 1970s, a famous uh, photojournalist who has an ex exhibition right now at the Fitchburg Art Museum. Um, but this picture for me sums up a lot about the um, 
feelings towards the state in Afghanistan. Look closely at this picture. All of the, the policemen are in these sharp uniforms. They're all wearing their hats. Again, I'm sorry, the quality is not great. But if you look carefully, none of them are bearded. Um, the old man clearly has his beard. Um, notice the contrast in dress. And I like the way the photographer has sort of caught, look at, notice the downward slant, the stare, you know, the looking down at him. Um, and then here's the man's wife or his daughter. Notice she seems sort of the worried glance over her shoulder. So I think that sort of is a nice image that sums up a lot of the feeling um, towards the state in Istalif. Um, so while Geertz helps us consider and understand this boundary between the state and society, I don't think his model fully explains for me why this boundary is so important. And here I want to make a little bit of a jump. I want to turn to some of the totalitarian literature on the state. And this may seem counterintuitive at first, but I think if we work with it, we'll see that it explains some of the understanding of this divide between state, society, and Afghan and Istalif. Um, a lot of the literature on totalitarian states tends to explore um, the use of elements such as the secret police. It explores how fear is used to expand control. Regimes often rely on propaganda, combining physical coercion and violence with psychological control. Of course, the um, archetypical example of this is Winston Smith in 1984, who so famously declares that 2 plus 2 equals 5. Um, but similarly to this, Vaclav Havel uses the example of the green grocer who puts up the sign in his window in his store, Workers of the World Unite. And here I quote, he puts this sign up not because he believes that the workers of the world should or will unite, but rather because these are the things that must be done if one is to get along in life. It is one of a thousand details that guarantee him a relatively tranquil life in harmony with society, as they say. Lisa Wadeen has pushed this notion further. She studies Syria and particularly the cult of Assad, of the president. And she calls this the politics of act, acting as if. She says that totalitarianism creates a charade state. It uses theater. It forces subjects to act as if they believe the ideology of the state, as if they believe the representations and the slogans. This creates coercion without the need for constant violence, simply the threat of it. She says, and here I quote again, citizens in Syria are not required to, to believe the cult's flagrantly fictitious statements, and as a rule, they do not. But they are required to act as if they do. In Istalif, we, as we have seen, there's little direct coercion there's little direct state penetration in daily life. But I believe that this is not simply because the state is weak. In a place like Istalif, with 250 stores in the bazaar, I believe collecting taxes would actually be fairly easy. This is something the state could do if it really wanted to. Similarly, the warlords and formal militias are fairly easy to identify. They don't hide. And they're strongly outnumbered by the police force, by the Afghan National Army, not to mention um, a vast number of international forces who uh, all live at Bagram Air Base just down the road. However, <coughs> no confrontation with these warlords or um, with these formal militia has ever really happened. And in Istalif, I believe, we can apply this concept of acting as if to help explain how the state and subjects have created this fictitious line. And having created this line, they agree to neither test the actual strength of the state nor test the actual strength of the subjects. The result in Istalif, I will argue eventually, shed some light, I think, on totalitarian systems as well, since in both cases, the politics of acting as if are used to reduce violence and make an unstable system more sustainable. And now I want to tell three ethnographic stories, which I believe reflect some of this politics as if in, um, in Istalif. And the first one takes place in the sub-governor's office 
um, the sub-governor district uh, governor is the main um, the main government official in town. And I was in his office on other business. I was just sort of lucky to be there that day. Um, and this story is a central part of my dissertation. And I'm going to have to gloss over a lot of it. But essentially what happened is there's a long dirt road to uh, Estelif. And there's been a big fight over whether that road was going to be paved or not. Finally, the Ministry of Rural Development said, yes, we're going to pave it. We're sending some engineers out, and they're going to survey the road. So I was in the governor's office, and the governor's office is set up where his desk is right here, the door is over there, and there's a long wall of seats here and a long wall of seats there. Um, and I sort of was sitting off to the side. I was wrapping up the work. I was talking to his assistant. Um, and the engineers came in and sort of sat in that corner. And the engineers and the sub-governor began to have this dialogue back and forth. But very quickly, news went around the bazaar that these engineers were in the governor's office. And very slowly, all the major political actors in town begin trickling in. So you get three or four maliks. Uh, the second most important warlord in town was there. Um, several mullahs came, uh, and a couple of businessmen were there. And the office fills fairly rapidly, sitting along this wall and along that wall. And this dialogue that began between the engineer and the district governor slowly begins to integrate these other parts. And it turns out that there's a faction in the room that opposes the room, and a faction that supports the room, and it's, er, supports the road, sorry. Um, and it seems that the faction opposed to the road um, is on this side, and the faction that supports the road is on this side. And increasingly, uh, the dialogue and the argument begins going back and forth this way, and the sub-governor removes himself from the debate. And I kept waiting for him to reassert himself. And I, I, at the time, I was uh, perplexed that he didn't step in and say something. And not only did he not say something, but at the door, there's a line of petitioners. And so he begins to gesture that some petitioners come in, and he starts filling out some forms and completely ignores this argument that's going on. The argument's getting more and more heated. People are yelling. I mean, there's this, almost the threat of violence. Um, and at this point, he gets up and leaves and simply walks out of the room. And I am, at this point, um, I also didn't know all the ins and outs of the situation at, the point, at that point. I did a lot of follow-up interviews about it. Um, but I'm left really scratching my head. And so there's quite a good deal of yelling going on. Eventually, this argument actually torpedoes the entire road project, and the road hasn't been built yet. Um, but a mullah finally steps in and calms everybody down, and this is what mullahs often do. Um, but they can't resolve their differences. And at this point, the sub-governor walks back into the office, and everybody sort of shake hands and, and pay their respect to the sub-governor, um, and everybody very respectfully walks out and leaves. Um, what I would argue has happened here is that the sub-governor is really unable to resolve this dispute. But most, both sides act as if that hadn't happened. Both sides ignore the gravity of the failure, uh, the gravity of the failure, and ignore the fact that the meeting has been hijacked um, by this side argument, essentially between these two other um, people over here. Um, both parties act as if it had never happened. Um, there's a real tension between the power that they have as column leaders, as former. Um, warlords, and the tension with the power that he has, but they ignore this tension, um, and they sort of gloss over it all. The next story happened to me during uh, Ramazan, my second year there. Um, and as I said, there are two police chiefs in town. One, The first one was a very sort of laid back fellow. He was content to sit in his office and collect his uh, bribes and didn't really <laughs> get involved in town politics very much. And, but then they were, he was replaced. And the new guy who came into town, um, I hadn't met him yet, but I'd heard rumors about him. Uh, he apparently was trying to shake things up a little bit. There was there's one opium user in the bazaar, and he had apparently roughed him up the day before. Um, and it's Ramazan, so I'm asleep. And in the middle of the night, I hear very loud banging at my door. And my chowky door, who's a doorkeeper slash guard, um, who was sort of protecting the compound, um, was waking me up. And I thought at first he was waking me up because you, during Ramadan you wake up at 3 in the morning and you have breakfast. Um, so I go out expecting to have breakfast with him. Um, and it turns out that there's the police chief at about 2 o'clock in the morning with six to eight policemen. And uh, my guard is very 
um, worked up about this. He's very uh, nervous. Um, and the police chief immediately begins this long speech about how I was in great danger and I didn't have permission to be there and um, I needed to leave immediately. Um, and I, I, I slowed him down and I said, well, um, sir, uh, I do have permission from the sub-governor, I have permission from uh, the former police chief, I have permission from the Ministry of Culture. Um, he said, well, do you have written permission from the Ministry of Interior? And I said, no, no uh, but I'm sure I, we can talk about this and work it out somehow. Um, this is also slightly ironic because the Ministry of the Interior in Kabul is a true den of thieves. <laughs> so the idea of trying to get written permission from them in some way was quite daunting, especially at 2 o'clock in the morning. Um, and this was also a very uncomfortable situation for me because of the eight policemen, there was only one I even recognized. Um, and my guard, and they're all armed, of course, and my guard is armed. Um, and uh, my guard is clearly worked up. I mean, he's quite nervous about this whole situation. So finally, I say, Look, we'll, we'll talk about it in the morning, and I convince him to leave. Um, by the time I wake up the next morning, of course, the entire town knows about this incident. Um, and the Malik, who is the head of the column, who I was closely associated with, is immediately comes down and is so apologetic um, and apologizes for this great disruption. And uh, the same day, apparently, the mullah, the head mullah in town, calls up the uh, chief of police to tell him that he's stepped beyond his, uh, his realm. And uh, similarly, a couple days later, I heard that the uh, warlord paid a similar, the main warlord in town paid a similar visit to the police chief's office. Um, so finally, I decide I should go and sort of make up with him. So I go into his office, and he's completely unapologetic about the entire thing. Um, but as soon as I walk in, he says, you know, it's absolutely outrageous. You have one guard. And you have a big garden, why don't you have two guards? <laughs> and he had completely shifted the entire <laughs> argument and what he had been talking about. And he was still very angry with me. Um, and I said, okay, I'll order another guard. And then I left. Um, again, sort of perplexed by the entire thing. And what had really happened was I had my wife, of course, in the house. and. He, in the eyes of most Istalifis, he, as the policeman, had overstepped his bounds. You know, you would never enter a house where there, a man has a woman. And as um, a friend of mine, a very sort of meek, quiet man, told me, you know, Noah, this is why you should live with me, because if that policeman ever crossed my threshold, um, and it became very menacing for a very uh, sweet, small man. Um, but what the police chief had to do was he immediately acted as if it hadn't happened. Um, very similarly, um, as I quizzed uh, the Malik and the Mullah, um, they too, it turns out, didn't confront him directly on any of this. What was done instead was it was done in a very roundabout way. They didn't accuse him of actually entering my house. They simply said, oh, you know, Noah down in the bazaar, he's a friend of mine, and let it be known that I was associated with them and in their protection. My last example here is I want to talk for a minute about what happens when this acting as if breaks down. Um, what happens when the theater no longer works? And this is something that didn't happen to me. It actually happened just down the road from Estelet. But this is a national incident. Um, and the rumors of this went around this quite quickly. The two main players in this are the Attorney General, Sabat, um, who is a close ally of Karzai's, and General Jaras, who is a former and the general is a bit of a dis misnomer. He's not actually the general. Um, he is a Panjshiri Tajik who, uh, following, uh, in, during the interim government, rose as high as number three in the Ministry of the Interior. But later on, Karzai uh, cleaned house of a lot of these Panjshiris, um, and he had been forced out of the Ministry of the Interior. And like many warlords in the Ministry of the Interior who uh, have been forced out of power, he immediately set up a security company. Because a security company can then provide um, security to um, rich Kabbalists, and they provide security to NGOs. And this is basically a legal way of maintaining the militia. So General Sabat, uh, Attorney General Sabat, is on his way <coughs> north 
past is to live on a Friday. And on Fridays, lots of it, Kabbalists um, head out of town um, on this road to go on picnics. Um, this is it in the winter, of course. So during the spring, everybody takes this road out of Kabul. And it's got three lanes, one that goes this way, one that goes that way, and one that's ambiguous that you pass on. Um, and on a Friday, you run into these huge traffic jams on this road. Um, and so Attorney General Sabit and a few of his guests are stuck in this traffic jam. And uh, quite often, you get cars that refuse to yield. And so you get sort of these traffic jams with gridlock where no one can go anywhere. So Attorney General Sabit quite angrily steps out of his convoy and begins ordering cars around. You go there, you go there. Um, and it's at this point that, attorney, that General Jarat, the former warlord, and it, in his convoy of about 12 pickup trucks, comes speeding up the wrong lane. Um, and this is, happens quite often. The, uh, militia leaders do this, uh, state officials do this, the international military does this all the time. Um, but Attorney General Sabit stops the convoy um, and immediately starts berating uh, the first driver. And here's where different versions of the story sort of vary. I'm telling you the story as I heard it from uh, people in Istalif. Um I later chased up some of the details in Kabul. Um, but he starts yelling at the first driver of the car because the, drive, the car didn't have license plates. Um, and this was a big push. The uh, Afghan government was trying to promote the use of license plates. Um, General Jarat, who is notoriously short-tempered, um, storms out of the fourth car up to Attorney General Sabit. This is the Attorney General of the country. Um, and hits him with a water bottle. <laughs> uh, this then becomes blows are exchanged. The two men are sort of pulled apart. But in the meantime, the two men have security details of 50 people each. Um, so it's a very tense moment as these two groups are separated in the middle of a traffic jam with tons of civilians sort of scattered around them. Um, and this is done on the road right next to a compound of a very low-level warlord in Estelef, um, who um, is allies with General Jarrah. They're from the same tribe. So the uh, low-level warlord takes General Jarrah in, um, and General Jarrah sort of sits there overnight. Uh, Attorney General Sabit gets increasingly angry about this, and the next morning, uh, Attorney General Sabit oversees the storming of the compound with 40 policemen. Uh, but General Jarrah's men repulse uh, the attack and kill six policemen and one civilian. Um, in the confusion, the Attorney General, uh, the General Jarrah, who had been in the compound, sneaks out the back door um, and drives up to the Panchir, essentially escaping. Um, what happens next is interesting because you get the government in Kabul calling for the arrest of Jarat, but increasingly in the Panjshir Valley, all the Panjshiris ra uh, rally around Jarat and um, essentially threaten to march on Kabul. Over the course of the next two days, they're very sort of tense days um, because there's the threat of instability. And what ends up happening, again, according to the rumors, and it's, this is hard to tell how much of this is true, but Karzai leans on Sabit, and Sabit goes on television and publicly apologizes to Jarat. And of course, he had nothing to apologize for. Jarat's the one who hit him with a water bottle. Um, but apologizes to him. Um, and says on national TV, you know, this is all a misunderstanding. General Jarat and I are friends, and we have always been friends. Um, but what's happened here is clearly the government doesn't approve of the actions of Jarat. But they're not really strong enough to stop him either. Similarly, Jurat, while he may be strong, he wants to maintain the system as it is, where he can keep a sizable militia that allows him to exert power outside of the state control, but not necessarily overthrow the state, because overthrowing the state creates a much more chaotic system. This actually is representative of the entire relationship, I would say, between the government in Kabul, which is oftentimes perceived as very Pashtun, and uh, the Panjshiri Tajiks, who have a disproportionate amount of power because they're the ones who uh, were assisted by American troops early. They were the first ones to come into Kabul. Um, this relationship certainly could end up in violence, but it does not because both sides have it in their best interest to essentially ignore the tensions between them. And they ignore the fact that the power is not clearly defined between the two groups. 
Well, I think, and as a result, what you really see is that the Afghan state here is playing a two-sided game. First of all, to the international world, the Afghan state is acting as if it controls the country, as if it controls the subjects. Um, because it figures this is how the international community is the only way for it to accept it. At the same time, to the subjects, it is acting as if it is the only link to the international world. So to the town of Istalif, it's representing itself as the Istalifi's only hope for continuing <coughs> to receive economic aid, for continuing to receive um, a military presence that stabilizes the situation some. These representations, this acting as if, I argue, creates a line between state and society and defines the state in the perspective of most of my informants. People understand that this is a lie, that this is fiction, but at the same time, it's in everybody's best interest. The state probably could penetrate further, but to do so would represent the act. The people probably could throw off the state, but at the same time, the alternatives are worse. These people don't like the Taliban, and they're fairly resentful of the warlords who they think abuse them. The result, there are three results, I would say. Acting as if allows each side to ignore the gray areas. It allows them to ignore the powers that the warlords have. And this, in turn, essentially lowers violence. Secondly, it allows people like the district governor to yield autonomy to community leaders. So oftentimes, community leaders are actually the ones making these decisions, even though they're the decisions that the state should be making. Um, so while democracy is not necessarily getting the correct, the leaders that the people want into power, the, this lie is allowing the community leaders who are best informed to actually make these decisions. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, this lie allows um, the international dollars to continue to flow into Istanbul. So I just want to wrap up with three conclusions here and three sort of levels of confusions, or conclusions, excuse me, um, <laughs> and confusions. In terms of understanding the state, Wadeen says in Syria that, quote, everyone participates in the maintenance of the system that victims also uphold the system through their participation, suggesting that political systems can be reliant on, defined by, and functionally inseparable from citizens' habitual obedience to them. I think what we have in Istalif is actually similar, but I would raise some questions, first of all, about agency, and I would replace the word victim. So when she says that political systems can be reliant on, defined by, and functionally inseparable from citizens' habitual obedience to them, what we need to realize is in this, par in this case, the actors, very differently from the totalitarian state, actually have a choice. The myth of the state in Istalif is created both by the state and by the subject. We need to understand that it's not simply coercion, sometimes it's also compromise. In Afghanistan, acting as if does not necessarily aid coercion, but it allows this unstable, ambiguous balance to maintain itself while reducing overt violence. I think also that the totalitarian literature sometimes ignores how quickly totalitarian states collapse. Such states that use politics as if rely on a fiction, and once that fiction is publicly exposed, the entire state is in, the entire system is in danger of collapse. This, of course, why individuals who reject the system, like Winston Smith or like General Girat, are actually such a threat. Totalitarian states at times quickly crumble, and this is why, despite current stability in Istalif, the entire system, while at peace now, could erupt in violence rather quickly, I would argue. My second conclusion for my dissertation for how I think about politics in general in Istalif is we need to understand that politics in Istalif has multiple actors that have created this precarious balance that I've been discussing. And ironically, it's not the guns of the international military that have brought a temporary truce, but it's the ability of the Afghan state and subjects to create a fiction which, in turn, manipulates the international community and continues to have aid flow in. I think there's a couple salient points here. 
First of all, the international community as an actor is really mostly changing the rhetoric of the game. When we ask about democracy in this situation, for example, how do act individuals access power, one of the questions we also have to ask is, when is it in the best interest of some of these act actors to actually struggle for power, and when is it for, in their best interest simply to wait and see? So what you get, I would argue, especially with warlords at this point, is it's in their best interest to simply wait and see and see how things go. To a real extent, I'm arguing that the democratic processes in Afghanistan have become de-incentivized. And even more than has historically been the case in Afghanistan, I believe that the fiction discussed today is simply part of this. So finally, is Afghanistan a failed state? Well, I think as I've hopefully shown, failed state is simply a bit of a rhetoric that is being manipulated by both sides. For the United States and the international community, it allows our government to explain international intervention. It allows us to become comfortable with and support a military and development economy, which is quite important with what's happening in Afghanistan. For the current regime in Kabul, it also this term, failed state, simply ensures more aid and international attention. Karzai it's all, has often been blamed on being simply weak. But Karzai has not reined in former warlords, in part because he hasn't tried, and in part because he hasn't needed to try. The international community should take a harder look at who benefits from the phrase failed state and from instability. Answers here, unfortunately, are not easy ones, because there's a wide array of people who are actually benefiting from instability in Afghanistan right now, such as the current regime in Kabul, such as the government in Pakistan, um, such as warlords outside of the Pashtun belt, particularly. Similarly, the Taliban was able to absolutely control opium production, and yet the current regime, with all the aid from international community, has been unable to. That should be much more striking than it is, than it has been publicly perceived at this point. A lot of what's going on here, I think, is aid is entering the country, subsidizing farmers to create alternative livelihoods. And there's quite an economy that's sprung up in spending this money. Afghans are aware of how quickly the West forgets about Afghanistan. Following the, Soviet, um, the withdrawal of the Soviet troops, we quickly left. Um, and I would say they realize that um, if peace and democracy sprung up in Afghanistan, aid is going to be reduced drastically. I think Tom Barfield here would probably point out that historically this fits the model of Afghanistan as a rentier state. The subsidies initially came, of course, from raiding India. Later, the subsidies came from the Russian and British Empire. Later, the subsidies came during the Cold War from the United States and the USSR. And now, of course, they're coming from the coalition of countries that are fighting the war on terrorism. The rhetoric of Afghanistan as a failed state simply allows this system to continue. So as an academic, I think Afghanistan as a failed state is actually not a productive term. But what is more productive, I think, is asking what the effects of this term are on local politics. Um, and finally, this brings me to um, the questions that I am now most interested in as I step beyond the dissertation. Um, but what's really interesting in Afghanistan, of course, is that you have these elections coming up in August. Inshallah, as they would say, we'll see if it actually happens. Um, and what's the rather interesting development is Karzai's lukewarm, or sorry, Obama's lukewarm support for Karzai at this point. And most of the Afghans I know want to know um, and I'm not being too facetious here, but want to know who they should vote for. Um, and this is not as undemocratic as it sounds. It's simply, in the political system right now, some of the greatest incentive for many Afghans, particularly those living in Kabul, is continued international intervention of a certain type. So they feel that voting for the candidate the US supports is what's going to allow international aid and military troops to continue their presence there. Um, if the Obama administration is not clearer on some of these issues, we're going to see some very pol interesting political negotiations as the coalition of tribal leaders that Karzai surrounded himself with starts to break apart. Um, this, I believe, will be most interesting among uh, non-Pashtun groups, and I've chosen four minority groups that I'm, hopefully I'm going to trace these minority groups through the election process. Um, 
but I'll have to tell you how that turns out once I get back. So, thank you very much. I'm sorry I jumped around, but I'm more than happy. fascinating and appropriately complex. Um, I have a question about the nature of the state. I, I take your point, I think it's a very good point, about the rhetorical uses of the idiom of a failed state on all sides. What, um, what it still leaves me wondering is what kind of state is it? And uh, to say it's not a Weberian state is a good beginning, but as a number of people working on Central Africa, for example, where you have states that make yeah. Afghanistan look like yeah. uh, you know, a, a German bureaucracy, uh, as well as some unexpected places, the state in rural India, or for that matter, the state in Eastern Indonesia, Indonesia where I work. Uh, and what people find there is that you know, the barbarian model doesn't work. Uh, these are not, it's not sufficient to say these are failed states so the literature over the last 15 years or so has moved in the direction, uh, let me add here again, in <coughs> India as well, uh, in the direction of highlighting just the networks whereby uh, state agents and actors, whoever they are and however they are elected, uh, develop networks with society. And indeed in some instances those networks are so intimate and so important that uh, the scholars who work on this, these issues say, well, it's not clear that we shouldn't call some of those networks that reach deep into society indeed part of states. But it's, they're not the formal state, they're not the official state, but they're so vital to the operations, to the personnel, to the funding and all the rest that we associate with the state, they somehow should be recognized as part of it. And so the phrase that get, gets used is this is part of the shadow state. And uh, it seems to me that a lot of what you're describing, first of all, everything you describe rings very, very true and very important. And again, you, you had a kind of appropriate rhetorical aim of sort of tweaking the noses of uh, USAID officers and everything. But from an anthropological perspective, I would still ask, what kind of state is it? And I'm a, the one thing I, I guess I'd press you on is I'm a little uncomfortable with the idea that the there is this kind of clear symbolic divide between state and society. That doesn't really exist as, as clearly in the West yes. as we often assume, let alone in India, in central Congo, or uh, you know, even Germany. Yeah. Um, a couple quick things to add, just in response. Um, I take all of your points. Um, I've been particularly going through the African literature, actually. And this is really a direction I've only been working on for the last three weeks or so. Um, and I've read some of the Membe by art in, in that, and I find a lot of fascinating things there. Um, and I think there is some places I could go further with that. I haven't looked at the Indian example yet. I'd love to uh, figure some of that stuff out. Um, part of what I'm interested in here, though, and the only response I would have is that one of the things that I'm very interested in here is that a lot of the Afghans I know, while it may be a shadow state, while there are elements of this, they're very adamant about not wanting it to be that. And they're, it's, they would like to imagine the state as Weberian. Um, whether it is or not is another question, and I think I need to get into that more. But I think it's very interesting that they're so adamant about it. Um, Does that include the gentleman who was given the Toyota dealership or his son? <laughs> yes, because he, he, he would, would say, prefer that he the, would, the, the he would say I have nothing to do with the state right now. And, and that would not be absolutely correct. Mm -hmm. And there's some interesting things going on in terms of privatization of the state, of course. And you can argue to a real extent that these warlords are actually an extension of the state if you wanted to go in that direction. But the warlords themselves would not argue that. I so guess that's sort of what I and I, I think I think I need to add what a lot of the stuff that you're discussing into what the state actually is. But I guess what I'm discussing here is much more 
how they're describing the yeah. state. Yeah. It's just final comment. I guess a way of thinking about this, and whether you go with the literature on the shadow state or not, uh, the the kind of processual and analytic exercise that they encourage us to do is first of all dispense with the state society division as a kind of analytic yes. uh, sort of given. And instead, just focus on networks. And if, for the sake of heuristics, uh, look, for example, at, at a particular bureaucracy or government official and see where his or her networks lead. Actually. And at some point, uh, it may turn out that you end up with people like those that you just described. Apparently, the Toyota dealer who obviously was very dependent upon the state, closely linked yeah. to it, benefited from it, but OK, today he says, I'm not in that network. But at any rate, follow the networks wherever they go, and then ask, uh, how does the state work? And, and then you know, bring, come back to the point, I think it's a very good and a very interesting point that you made today, which is that for some reason, despite the fact that it ain't at all like what they think, they want it to be a Weberian state. That is yeah. rather astonishing. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I, th I think it's uh, you're, I really enjoy your presentation, but I think um, your characterization of the divide between the city and society, because you say you're not arguing that there is actually such a divide, but you know, people from the both sides try to you know, maintain such a divide, but I think that the same stories that you offer, the three stories can be told in the totally opposite ways, because I feel like the, the, in three stories, it's, it's always the, the side um, of the state. They, they don't know what's going on, and they can they can deal with the complex, and they can identify people. And then as a local leader, they step up and kind of you know just you know, resolve the, the issue and dispute. And then they pretend that okay, we are we are in fact you know good friends of, with with the government. So if, rather than there is no such a divide, and then they maintain that such divide. In fact, it's the opposite way that, in fact, there is such divide in, in substantial ways, but they try to erase that kind of divide and, uh, you know, maintain the image or the false consciousness. So they would like to maintain as if their state is a Bavarian state or still not a failed state. And I truly agree with you that we can't rely on, uh, rely on such a you know, idea about the, the division because actually there is a parasite relationship, parasite relationship between the state and the society because because um, the, the the society local leaders they, should, they, they still want to the economic aid coming in and so there's a parasite relationship between them, but also between the government and the NGOs they want to you know reduce the violence they want to sell material goods into it. But I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering that in, in reinterpreting your stories, that exactly in, in a substantial way, in reality, that it is such divided, uh, invented or maintained, or in fact, the people try to erase that divide. I don't think they're trying to erase it. And maybe one of the things that I didn't hit clearly enough in my stories is um, this is not simply a weak state. I mean, let's be clear, if the police chief wanted me out of town, it wouldn't have taken him that much more work. I mean, all he had to do was come back another couple of times. I mean, it was certainly a rather scary incident. Um, similarly, in terms of the Attorney General Sabit, um, I think if he had uh, been able to throw his clout around a little bit more, um, he could have gotten a lot more than 40 troops uh, storming that place. So I think it's it's constantly, it's it's being negotiated constantly. Thank you. No, that was really interesting um, to see what you've been doing. Uh, I have a question that um, it, it reminds me a little bit of one of Tom Barfield's uh, talks about Afghanistan that I heard some years ago. And he was talking about the relations between the tribes, how the tribes would have alliances and then they wait to see like who would win, and just before you became clear who would win, they just switch over there. Um, you know, and so what it seems to me you're talking about is a strategic, um, uh, uh, strategic use of ambiguity, strategic tolerance for ambiguity. That was in all of the stories, uh, but if that is in, if that is indeed also how tribes deal with one another, then that doesn't seem to me, in your in this situation with the state, the 
as if situation. It really has very much to do with the totalitarianism of the state at all. In fact, perhaps the state is nothing more than another bunch of people with guns and money mm -hmm. that are being strategically manipulated in this ambiguous way, incorporated, um, and they, they know that they have to present this relationship in a certain way in order to get the money. Um, but you know that maybe the use of any of these state-linked theories are completely irrelevant. Mm -hmm. We want to think that it's a state. Right. You know, maybe why should we even use that terminology? That you're absolutely right, and I uh, at times despaired and almost ended up exactly where you are. And the thing I didn't get to in this talk, which I, partially because I haven't been able to think it all the way through, but. One of the very interesting things you get is there's still nationalism. It's not strong. There's not a lot of it. But especially the young men in Istalif will tell you, I am Afghan. Um, and the interesting thing about that, too, is Afghan, until fairly recently, meant Pashtun. So the fact that you have Tajiks saying, I am Afghan, which they realize has echoes of, I am Pashtun, is sort of interesting. And I think one of the things that's sprung up a little bit, and this might be the refugee experience, um, but there's also similarly um, an element of nationalism that's built around the, we defeated the Soviets. Um, so I think there's an element of that as well in there. Um, and, and there is the last point in terms of nationalism, is there is this sort of hardening back now to the good old days of Zaire Shah and Daoud, um, and especially the old men talk about how great the uh, conscription army back in the 60s and 70s. And all the old men will tell you how great it was. You know, it was all of us, the Pashtuns, Hazaras, all together, and we all lived in the barracks. And I'm sure it was awful. Um, so I think the direction you're going and the direction that some act international uh, policy people um, go with what, with the idea of maybe we should just stop talking about the state, I think would then result in the solution of let's chop up Afghanistan into six pieces and give the Pashtun belt to the Pakistanis, give the Herat to the Iranians, and give the um, Uzbek chunk to the Uzbek. That's, that's us not wanting any ambiguity. Right. It's not that. Right. But, but what I'm saying is I think that there's that conception of while the Afghan state might be weak, while it might be something they want an ambiguous line around so that they can continue to not pay taxes, um, there's still something. And I, I realize I need to work through this. All right, so you made a point of noting that the international presence is a mm -hmm. power player in this game. Yes. And that these people are willing to buy into this fiction for the sake of keeping this international aid flowing and so forth, what would happen right now if the American government would say disappeared? This is, uh, uh, to a certain extent, the ambiguity that Professor Lloyd was just talking about. I think nobody knows. Um, because I think the warlords haven't been tested. Because the Taliban hasn't been tested. Um, my sense is um, the growing Taliban presence in the South, and let's be clear, I know nothing about the South. I've never been there. Um, but the growing, from what I've heard, the growing Taliban support in the South comes from very much anti-Western troops there. So um, a lot of people argue that you subtract the international presence and the Taliban essentially fizzles out. Um, so so would it have an effect on, on the area around Istalif if it's mostly a southern, or if it's, it's a stronger issue right. in the south? Right, so, so essentially I think the answer is um, if the international presence vanishes tomorrow, the Taliban don't simply ride into Istalif and reconquer it. Um, something else will happen. It's a little unclear what. Um, and this we've talked about in the, our seminar a little bit, but another thing that I'm very interested in uh, in terms of how the international community talks about um, Afghanistan. But, Everybody comes back to, you know, oh, there was a power vacuum out of it. So, um, and one of the things I've come to strongly believe is there's no such thing as a power vacuum. Somebody's always in control. Um, and after the government left, it was a group of local local warlords. When the local warlords were off fighting against the Taliban, it was the tribal leaders. But there's always somebody in control. Um, 
And so my guess is, if the international community just vanished, what you would get is you would get a lot of regional powers. And a guy like Ishmael Khan, who's the warlord out in Herat, would then sort of solidify his grasp on Herat. Um, Istalif is probably close enough to Kabul that any remnants of whatever the national government is would continue to hold Istalif um, with some negotiation with the Pontsherry Tajiks. Yeah, my question to you, I guess, resonates a little bit of what Professor Hafner and Professor White were saying. Yes, the two principles I still see in there, and even after you, after what you said, which is, for example, I, I really understand what you're what you're what you're saying in terms of different groups, uh, you know, also of fighting for some power, let's say, disputing some power, but at the same time recognizing uh, boundaries into some sort of, you know, like they made some deals, let's say, into to the extent of their influence. You know what I mean? So to that extent, you don't have to see, let's say, the state as just another tribe, but you can see the sphere of influence of the state bounded to some sort of you know, <laughs> practices or something like that. For, for instance, it's the same kind of thing that, or similar to what you can see in Lebanon, where the state isn't there. It's very important. Everybody says they're Lebanese, though they've heard, they have very different ideas of what to be Lebanese is. But the state never interferes into personal matters of, you know, religion or, or like many other matters of, you know, marriage, inheritance, or whatsoever. That's, you know, the the the, the religious councils take care of that, right? And at the same time, I mean, you still have a compromise between what the state is supposed to do and what the other organs or the other factions, whatever you want to call it, are supposed to do. So I still see what Professor yeah. White is saying that even though you don't have, you, you don't have to call like you don't have to drop the idea of the state out, right. but you can st still put the state as just a player, and I think that yeah. goes along with what Professor Hefner was saying to you before. Well, I think the only thing that sort of radically different from what you just described is I think the gray area here is simply much larger. Um, right. That's the ambiguous the, yeah. the, the, the that you know, the Professor White was saying, but there's still some compromise too, yeah. and that also is important to notice. Yeah. Right. That's that's why the color sh the term shadow is used. Yes. Because it is gray. Yeah. It's not black and white. Right. It's a strategic color. Strategic <laughs> color. <laughs> uh, yeah. Thank you for a very insightful presentation. Uh, my question was basically uh, linked with uh, you mentioned that in the town of Istalif, if the mm -hmm. government wanted, mm -hmm. it, there were like 250 uh, shops. Uh -huh. It could go in and tax them. It was possible, it was in the capacity of the government, but it mm -hmm. never actually did it because it wanted to maintain the divide. Yes. So the ability to tax uh, its citizens is one of the basic uh, prerequisites for establishing or, or, or removing that divide between the state and the citizens because if the funds which keep this uh, government or some people who call, call it tribe mm -hmm. or people with guns and money or mm -hmm. whatever they are, if the money for their uh, activity is coming not from the people, it's coming from outside, mm -hmm. then this situation is not going to resolve anytime soon. And and, and and the incident you mentioned in which the government was not willing to step up and defend the Attorney General, actually they were mm -hmm. uh, asking him to apologize to the warlords so mm -hmm. that they're not going to impose their uh, control <coughs> over the fragmented uh, yeah local people who are, who are challenging the authority. So where do you see this going? Because unless until they start taxing and establishing that link, that's not happen. There is not going to be no solution for the government. And uh, the fact that even today, like even as you mentioned, the government is not going to stand up. So what do you see is going to be the way out for well, I mean, I didn't promise you a rosy picture. <laughs> um, I think, to, economically speaking, Afghanistan has serious trouble. I mean, one of my, a friend of mine's favorite quote that you'll understand from Pakistan is, if Afghanistan grows, economy grows at 15%, which is, of course, a ridiculously high number, for the next 20 years, it will catch up with Pakistan. Okay. So they're in a hole. Um, <laughs> let's be clear about that. Um, where they're standing right now, I understand, and I wonder how much this is a political science concept, but of the necessity of taxes. Because the truth of the matter is Afghans have never paid taxes, full stop. Um, it's always been a situation where money goes from the center to the periphery. 
um, the king, the shah, whoever it is, has given subsidies out to tribes that have supported him. Not to the God. What's that? The God, the the alms giving, the zakat tax. Um, yeah. Oh, zakat. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but for the most part, that stays within the tribes. So there will be done that. That will happen on a local level. Um, but most of the money has come came from in the early period from raiding uh, Persia or raiding India. Um, so what you have now. Um, nobody's in a rush in Afghanistan to collect taxes anytime soon because imposing taxes on a group of people who are notoriously uh, dissident and have never paid taxes before is challenging. And I, the belief, I think, what they're really hoping <coughs> is that customs duties, um, which you can control, customs duties combined with continued international aid will be enough to run the state. Um, and let's also be clear, the state in Afghanistan doesn't require that much to run because it's small and weak. So that's the most optimistic picture I could paint, I guess, of it functioning. But it's a real, it's a real problem, especially down south. I mean, essentially, what happened was a massive amount of people in the 1960s were moved into the Helmand Valley um, because there was this great irrigation project, um, and the irrigation project failed. As a result, the only thing they can grow now is opium uh, for the system. So um, <laughs> there's no alternative. And that's what the Taliban did. They started uh, enforcing the toll tax between uh, the major groups coming from Afghanistan uh, to Central Asian yeah. states. Uh, and that's how they actually earn whatever little money they need to but, actually. Well, the Taliban states. never imposed taxes. The toll tax. No, but that's like never on individuals. Not within on the individual, country, obviously, yes. But that's essentially the same thing yeah. as a custom. Yeah. Well, if people have other questions, I'm more than willing to hang out, but thanks a lot for coming out.